summer months, you had to pay the full minimum wage. During the school year, you could pay a student um, during vacation periods or during the school year, like working at nights, you could pay them the federal minimum <coughs> wage. We didn't change that, we just, but we made it clear that it was only applicable to secondary school students, not to college students. It's not summer vacation. During summer vacation, the department has interpreted to mean that you have to pay full minimum wage, which would be 10, 1078 right now. Which section? Page three at the bottom. Page three at the bottom. It's on page two of ours, though. Um, oh. Section two. That would cause section that would cause problems. <laughs> well, I looked down. I get a copy. Let me get a copy of this one. That's right here. Take my copy. But it's the bottom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you did. It's the section you got on yes. definitions. Yep, I got it. I'm sorry. I have a different version. Yeah. Uh, but now I have, a, thanks I to Senator Ash, I have the correct version. <laughs> Down on page three. Yeah, I'm sorry. Never mind. Yeah. So the, the section three on child care, uh, you recall last year, um, the summer study we did on this, which is a very extensive summer study, was called the Minimum Wage and Benefit Cliffs Study. And there was concern that if you raised low-income workers minimum wage up, that they would lose so much in benefits that they would go backwards. And what we were told by the Joint Fiscal Office and Deb Brighton that the real problem area in loss of benefits was childcare benefits. So last year we said that people would stay would be held harmless from an increase in the minimum wage on their childcare benefits. We had the wisdom in our committee to put the words at the beginning to the extent funds are appropriated because we knew you would put it in anyway, even if we didn't. So we got in front of you to say no, that's- we take it out and not withstand it, Michael. Same thing. Yeah. So the idea here was we knew you were gonna make the decision on this. We wanted to let you know that this was a concern and we did the same language. Again, the difference here is the language is um, a little, Looser, it has been approved by the, uh, uh, the Department of Children and Families, Deb Brighton, our legislative council, to accomplish the same goal, a statement of intent that uh, we would like uh, the Appropriations Committee with the added monies in terms of income and saved benefits that an increase in the minimum wage will give to the state budget to make sure these people don't go backwards on their ch child care benefits. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have two pieces, one of which is the sliding scale so that the parents it, getting the subsidy don't get disadvantaged. And then the second part is recognizing the increase in <coughs> wages for care exactly. providers. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, but again, it's a, to the extent you appropriate monies for the same. Uh, the minimum wage adjustment for inflation um, report. We continue to maintain, as we did in last year's bill that was vetoed, uh, a COLA based upon the CPI, but we also want to report back prior to the end of 2024, I think it's uh, January 15, 2023, end of 23, um, uh, an analysis of other possibilities that for inflation factors or whether there should be an inflation factor. Was in the bill last year too. That was in last year's bill. Um, we continue to uh, struggle uh, with two issues in our committee, and they were also things we dealt with last time, and we came to the same conclusion: was tipped employees is there are very strong advocates on both sides of this issue. Uh, a lot of restaurant owners want to get rid of the $5 and something they pay altogether or freeze it and not have it float with the increase in the minimum wage. Right now there's a formula that says a tip minimum wage employee shall get 50% of what our minimum wage is. 
So 50%. So if we're at 1078 now, they're getting 539 now. Uh, but a lot of their tips, they have to at least. It's mandatory it. that if they don't get up to the 1078, that the employer is supposed to make up the difference. We don't know. There's been apparently one case in the Department of Labor where somebody has had that enforced against them. So we don't know how often people complain. In fact, advocates who would like to see the tip minimum wage disappear and go to 1078 say that people are afraid <coughs> to complain. And they're also indicating that it leads to increased sexual harassment because people have to be, waitresses have to be more uh, accommodating to advances uh, in order to get their tips because they're so dependent upon their tips. It's that, has been, that has been purported by others, but not by you, correct? Not by me. Right, no, you're, I just yes, want to be clear. No, you're reporting what you had heard from others. The advocate, some advocates who want to get rid of the, uh, who want the tip minimum wage to be the same as the regular minimum wage make that case. Uh, we decided that it was worthy of a study, and I think it is. There are states go in a lot of different directions. Uh, some have one uniform wage, some have just used the federal minimum wage, $2.13 for two some, employees. Um, 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 restaurants have heard simply don't tip and they embed it right in the cost of the meal. Right. That's another uh, approach that people have started to use. Um, and that has met with a lot of, in Winooski, I know one restaurant's doing that, it's met with a lot of resistance from the wait staff and uh, some people like that, some people don't. It's it's not as straightforward as I, as I think it is. So I think we could benefit from knowing what this, you know, the best practices are out there in other states and what our options are. So who's on this committee? Uh, we put... Uh, and do we pay them? Only if they're legislators, I think. It's a choice that's... We have our standard language here, um, on page five where legislators are entitled to per diem, and then number two, if you're not getting compensated as part of the job, right. then you got No, I'm sorry. If you're not a state employee, right, exactly, you get paid, and if you're a legislator, you get paid. So, we normally put something in, if you're not getting paid as part of your job, as you're a state employee or not. Are, are there any other non-state employees here? In other words, regardless of who your employer is, if you're getting, your, if you're getting paid while you attend the meeting, we don't pay you twice. So I oh, that, yeah, we would have no, obviously, that's your choice, and I think that makes sense. Um, we, um, we have one member appointed by the speaker, one member appointed by the committee of committees. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's two members appointed by both of those people, one of which has to be an expert or represent business, and one has to be representing uh, workers. Uh, and we also threw in there because some members of our committee at, uh, at a very late stage wanted to get uh, rid of the, um, the school exemption that I talked about before. And they wanted to say school uh, work uh, students should get paid the full minimum wage year round, and we just said we would need to study that because we didn't take much testimony. Uh, can I just on that same vein with regard to where you have under the definition of secondary school students under 18 years age working and all or any part of the school year or regular vacation periods? How does the lay person, or maybe this is someplace else in here, how do they know that it doesn't include the summer vacation? It seems to me that's a regular vacation. How, how, does, how does the lay person know, know I think, that? I, I think that's an excellent question, and I think most people are unaware of this exemption. I think, for instance, Senator Mazza didn't even know that this exemption existed, but that's the position of the department. <laughs> well, so that's if you a, ask them, so I mean, that's okay, if you, but how does a layperson know it from reading I, this? I, I would. We they just left the language it. alone, but I, I think it's a good point. I would welcome uh, clarification of that, okay. and if you want, I would offer an is amendment. It clarification, by or is it simply how how does an employer know what their obligation is? Why wouldn't they think that the summer vacation? Well, 
probably because Department of Labor has no. uh, we could put in there we could put material. in there excluding summer vacations and make it just yeah, clear. Straightforward and clear. I think that's the intent of our language, but I think the center raised a good point. Uh, and and we would be if you want to do that, that's fine. We would be happy to do it too. I think my committee would be that's what was our intent. My I'm a little reluctant because if it's an interpretation and somehow it got altered and we put it in the statute and we haven't had any testimony, I'm not sure. Um, Why don't do it? Uh, what? Why don't they do it? I will take it back to my committee and maybe yeah. we'll have some testimony. Okay. I, I'm, I'm just saying, unless we want to take testimony on it, Alan, or get, no, have Department of Labor explain how they inform employers of their wage responsibilities. They, I'm sure they have lots of guidance that they send out, um, but I'm not sure. So I'd like them to take a look at it and do it so it's clear. Once I would, I'd be happy to do that. All right. So yes. just remind me so on the timetable that you said um, was last year's bill on um, um, uh, 2024 the end date. So you just simply are trying to keep the same end date as the last. Yes. Bill. Okay. Yes, Bobby. Uh, did you mention earlier that the federal minimum wage for tip workers was two dollars and something? Some. Yes, I'm so pretty sure it's it is. less than, not even half the minimum for tip workers, yes. But ours is half. Ours is half. And the federal minimum is seven and a quarter or something like 725. that? 725. Yeah. Um, other questions? Shall we move on? Right. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, I think I understand the language uh, starting at the bottom of page one. Uh, if the minimum wage rate established by the U.S. government is greater, et cetera. I think I understand the intention. I just want to, how comfortable, how sure are you that this is protecting people <coughs> from the so-called cliff? The idea that, that, that you get a raise and suddenly you're losing benefits. <coughs> I see that as inferred in this language. Um, there will definitely be some benefits that will go down, like food stamps will go down as a result of uh, getting an increase in the minimum wage if you're, if you're working at the minimum wage, but your child care benefits won't go down. So it, it, it is true that for every dollar we raise the minimum wage, minimum wage workers won't receive a total dollar increase in their in their, in, in their income. The index for each three dollars more you earn, the benefits reduced a dollar. So there's gain, but it's it's related, I, and we're not we are. Uh, that's a federal program, and we're yeah, not all yeah. And I, I referenced the wrong language. I mentioned section three. That's just so simply. So we can't change that. Food stamp benefits. Well, so that no, it'll get these people or encourage them to get off from. That in some ways, it, it's not a cliff, it's a slope, Bobby. Yeah. Actually, food stamps are more of a slope than any program because it, for every $3 more you earn, the benefit is reduced one. So you're gaining two bucks um, in that, under that formula. Um, a lot of the programs, you get up to X percent of the federal poverty level and you're totally off. There's no slope, it's just a cliff. So we can't change food stamp. Uh, um, eligibility. It's a, it's a federally funded benefit. But we what are about the health care. On health care? I mean, uh, can we call this other than something other than wages so that it <laughs> would <laughs> interfere with? Bobby, the, uh, I don't know. They, you know. In other words, if you get above 300% uh, of federal poverty level, we're going to create a slope. This is something that has been studied. And it, it can be done. It's just um, um, the cost it takes to do it. But food stamps is probably the most uh, uh, closely aligned to creating a slope than anything. One other question on the, uh, the relationship between tips and wages. Well, How does the um, on the relationship between tips and wages, 
How, how does the bill affect the situation where you go out to dinner and there's a, quote, service charge in the bill, which the layperson says, oh, what a nice employer. He's making sure the waitress gets a tip. But in fact, there are places where that service charge compensates management for the waitress's wages. That's your intent on page two, I bet, in section two, number this four. And the employee-mandated <laughs> service charge shall not be considered a tip, and therefore yeah. could not be counted as making sure that that employee is at the minimum wage, between right. tip and wage. That's the language I'm concerned with, Madam Chair. I just want to make sure, do, do you? Do you think this does not have loopholes? This, this, this is it, apparently this is existing practice, and it protect it's it's to protect the wait, waiter and waitress. I think this last year was raised by you, and that's why that language yes. is in there. Yeah, yeah. I'm not so sure. This is the same but as last year. Yes. Yeah. Ooh, um, thank you. Shall we keep going? Uh, I don't know how. Oh, we got to the study and. Um, um, what the committee's going to do, the Department of Labor will call it, and then we have our compensation on page five. That's it. Um, the only thing, um, Stephanie, on the last page, ballot number two, we we give uh, per diem compensation and reimbursement for members of the committee who are not employees of the state of Vermont. Okay, but if they should. I guess that was anticipating them be coming from private business or from the that sector as opposed because so many of our study committees are composed of people who get paid as part of their normal duty and we don't um, so we have something we put in who are otherwise not compensated by their employer so that it's not a double payment and Damien you know what I'm talking about um, yes. as a matter of protocol maybe it's good I, it may not mean that it has any relevance here, but we don't know who the appointments might be. So um, we could add that, just to keep it consistent with our normal um, language around compensation. Okay, that's okay with you? Yes. Yeah. All right, so the um, major piece that we're getting into, and this is what Bobby was talking about, and that's um, the, the slope or the impact on yeah. benefits, in this case, we're just dealing with the child care because that was, based on the analysis, seemed to be where people would be the most adversely impacted by this wage increase. So, other questions of the senator? Um, otherwise, well, if we could figure out some way to offset that, you know, if an employer has to raise their wages by a couple of bucks. And yet the recipient is going to lose a dollar from some federal program. That who's really won here? Nobody, because the recipient hasn't really won because they're only getting part of the one dollar of the two that the employers raised. They're losing money, maybe on their health care or their child care. So I think we should fix the fix the child care thing and the rent subsidy or whatever, so that at least everybody wins on this. Uh, the employer, if they've got to figure out a way to raise this extra money, why take it away from the recipient? You know, because we cut these other programs. I mean, I just worry that it's a road to nowhere because I've heard people here talk about getting all these benefit programs in alignment, but I'm guessing the reason it hasn't happened yet is because if you do one, it throws off the other, and then the other gets twisted and turned. Well, so, that or but I've actually, but because it's so complicated, I've heard people say, don't allow people to earn more when they show up for work because it'll take away a benefit from them. Well, that like a government true. program benefit, and I always think, well, that means that you're val valuing a government dollar more than a dollar earned, which would, I think, be That's a problematic not. position. So I, well, I agree with you that it's screwed up, but I worry the other, that there's um, a reason it hasn't happened before is because they no one's figured out how to make all the dials kind of... And we've had study after study on slopes 
cliffs, etc. Well, it, it comes if the state does it. It's um, the price tag is huge because you can get it into student um, assistance where people would earn more and it would reduce the amount of uh, financial aid um, for college. To, I mean, the um, public housing is another example. So, um, it uh, fuel assistance and the list goes on and on. So it. it it can be costly. My other question, though, is from a policy basis. People are arguing that wages should be raised to a livable level so that people are not so dependent on these financial benefits. I mean, that's another argument I've heard for um, having the wages keep pace more than they have. Is, was that, I mean, if you were to describe the policy basis behind this bill, how would you describe it? Income inequality, wage stagnation, wage gaps, people's taxpayers paying to keep, get people to a livable wage or a basic needs budget. Um, I had a handout, but it's probably more than you want, of charts showing where we are and stuff. Mm -hmm. But that's the policy behind it. And, uh, it used to be to like somewhere like in the 1970s where productivity in this country, uh, wage earners were keeping, getting a fair share of that productivity. Now there's this big gap where productivity's gone way up and the low income workers are not sharing in the gains. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is one tool to okay. help them yeah. yeah. Alphonse and Gaston. Yeah. I'm trying to understand what happened to the idea that we would base our, it goes along with your inflationary, but we, we several years ago decided we're not going to argue about minimum wage anymore. We're going to target the minimum wage based upon the rate of inflation. Many progressive and other causes, you know, went after the fifteen minimum <laughs> wage, and this bill gets to fifteen dollars, somewhat ahead of where we would have gotten had we just targeted the inflation. <clears throat> Why didn't we go back and increase, you know, the inflation? or rewrite the inflation factor to make sure that it kept up to some extent with the, more with the cost of living in Vermont, which I hope is the problem we're trying to solve and not just trying to say, well, New York's 15 and Seattle's 15 and this one's 15, so everybody that's got a Democratic legislature is going 15. Because right? you know, the argument back then was you vote for this now, and you'll never have to vote again on the minimum wage bill. Hmm. So. When was this? About, I believe it was about 10 years ago, just yeah, before you arrived. Time. Okay. Just before the progressive coalition. I don't remember being here when there was these. Well, I think Jim Douglas was the guy. I know that there was a, a bill. And, and that, that was the happened. promise, that was the promise made. Um, You'll never have to vote on a minimum wage bill. That's going to be this automatic. Other than idea. a crazy minimum wage that Jerry Morrissey proposed that would have been $50 an hour or something, which was a joke, I never voted against a minimum wage bill. But no, it was, it was designed to get at a certain senator who was claiming who had a business in Mexico where he wasn't charging much. <laughs> and Gerald pointed out to him that while he was advocating for a minimum wage in Vermont, his Mexican workers were being uh, taken advantage of. And so he proposed something like $30 an hour or something. It was a pretty gigantic boost that he would have really been sorry if it had ever passed. Other than that, I don't think I ever voted against the minimum wage bill. But we had continually were voting to increase the minimum wage. Yes. And finally yeah. everybody just stopped and we'll just uh, do this. So where is the problem? What happened? Well, I think it's what I just described, is that the cost of living and the basic needs budget is just going way up here. But, and, and but wages. why didn't we say, okay, well, let's increase the inflation factor? 
uh, rather than going after fifteen dollars. It might have gotten us to sixteen or seventeen if we did it that way. But it seems like this is kind of taking us backwards. Where next year the proposal, you know, would be seventeen or two years from now. I'd say. It's a the next, the next biennium, people will probably vote in on a seventeen dollar. That the fifteen didn't get us there close quick enough. Um, it's a different way of maybe getting to the same place. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I remember this. We had in our law um, the inflation factor being inflation or five <coughs> five percent, whichever is less. Mm -hmm. That was the, the inflation factor. And somebody from the business community said, why don't we just do inflation or 5%, whichever is greater, because inflation was so low. And that was pretty much the, the numbers that we came up with. It's just more traditional way of doing the minimum wage. I've been doing minimum wages way back when. when the first one I did was $3.10. Yeah, so you've been, so I think we're setting ourselves up to be continually voting on increased minimum wage, which we wanted, and to I think avoid. it makes, pardon me? To avoid. To um, avoid this, a, um, a continually voting thing. on a minimum wage increase by not going after that inflation factor and saying, well, this hasn't come up, you know, so finding a formula that takes into account the minimum, the basic needs and making sure that the minimum wage stands with that. Well, that's part of the reason we have this Study well, but I, yeah, but I say I don't. I it's just the way it's going to work. I won't be here when you have the 14th vote on minimum wage in the next five years. Well, but I would I would guarantee you that this is going to be a, every biennium you'll have a minimum wage vote if you don't deal with something like this. I think it was it, it may not have been the right factor. It may may have been too slow. Whatever. And I realize it's hard to step back now with three weeks to cross over. But I would hope that we could at least avoid these continuing debates. I would say, I would say one thing just to put it a little bit in concrete perspective that last year, I think it's gotten worse, that to reach $15 under existing law, you'd have to wait till 2034. I, I'm not. Michael, I'm not even arguing against the fifteen dollars. Right, just I'll a different form. Fifteen dollars. Right. I'm just saying I'm hoping that you will find a way a to avoid forcing the next legislature to continually vote to make it seventeen, to make it eighteen. So I have Senator Westman and then Alice. Um, you know, I hear all the stuff about the minimum wage. <coughs> For me, the pressure this creates on the budget. Did you take any testimony? I've got um, child care um, providers that um, this is going to, on the side of the wages that they have to. Um, I have one child care provider that tells me that per kid it's $40 a week extra they're going to have to, um, um, to make up. Um, I, my mental health agency um, um, is going to for us to maintain that is going to have to have increase. My home health agency, um, how many <coughs> testimony did you take from those pieces? Um, we took testimony from all the same people we took, both in the summer study committee and in last year's bill, and we did an analysis that showed that uh, even in the school districts, that every step of the way, there was very little immediate impact, and and on most of the areas you talked about, there was likely to be no impact into 2024. Um, so we did all that, and we have an analysis both in the Joint Fiscal Office last year and also in the summer study in a lot of depth as to that, and it's surprisingly less than you would think. I'm not saying it's non-existent, but it's pretty small. That's, that isn't what I hear from my report. But for child care, we are addressing it. You are addressing it. Okay. Out of it. that provider universe. Right. No, you are, you are addressing it for um, the subsidy and the fee scale kits. No, there are two pieces, one of which is the cost of labor. It, that's what number two, I think, yeah. as I read it, was attempting to do 
to, um, to offset the estimated increase of the cost of child care resulting from the increase in minimum wage required in this act. So I think that is the only provider um, group that is specifically addressed here in terms of impact. Um, other questions, and then maybe we can go into. So, um, yes. Um, so, with regard to when the report happens, mm -hmm. 2023, mm -hmm. and say, so get the report, say the legislature is in a very conservative bent that year mm -hmm. and says, okay, we're just going to ignore that report. So, then is it true then that the that the waged employee will then be at $15 an hour without any chance of an increase? If, if the legislature did nothing, the yeah. existing CPI would kick in. It would. Yes. Is that spelled out someplace? Or it's an existing law it's right now. It's an existing now. law that that will kick in if, right. if they do nothing. Right. Okay. That's the default. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's good to know. Okay. Any other questions of the senators? Otherwise, um, we'll, um, is it Deb that's going to testify then in terms of the analysis? Um, uh, that was undertaken. Right, George? Um, I just, I'm just to get that out. I found the web also. For the record, I'm Deb Brighton, and I'm a consultant to the Joint Fiscal Office. And if you have maybe five minutes, I can take you through this picture first. It will sort of explain why the Section 2 in the bill exists. Okay? So this is just an example of one of the families in the um, basic needs budget. This is a two-parent family, two working parents, two children. The children are six and four. The six-year-old goes to school full day but needs child care after school. The four-year-old gets pre-K, um, but otherwise has child care full time. And so across the bottom is a household at different wage levels. So this, the numbers across the bottom would be their total wages. Then the height of the bar represents the total resources that they have available to them to meet their basic needs. So the blue, dark blue part, the bottom part, is what they end up with as their after-tax income. This year. That goes up, yeah, the bottom wedge, that goes up smoothly. <clears throat> then on top of that, you have monthly benefits, which are mostly, in this case, um, Medicaid going into the exchange, healthcare, also um, fuel assistance, um, and let's see, then, um, the other ones that we have are food stamps, which is a fairly big one to stand on its own, and, and it's all federal. Then after that, the blue color is tax credits, and that shows significantly the EITC at the low end. Um, both federal and state? Yes, okay. both. And then the top part is child care subsidy. And I've also included in that purple color on the top um, pre-K, which is why it continues up at the high income, because pre-K goes to everybody no matter what income. And so then if you look at the bottom where I've shown a little arrow on the bottom, minimum wage current law, and then if it were $15 an hour in this same year, and then you look at what's happening at that income range, and their net resources are actually dipping down in that income range. And it's what exists now. It's not caused by the minimum wage change. We have this issue where um, before people are really making ends meet, if they earn another dollar, they can lose more than a dollar. And it's a combination of everything. Um, however, if you just visually take off that part, <coughs> you can see that the family, if they didn't need childcare, even though they're losing other benefits, they continue to increase. The light blue. If you take off that purple in the yeah, very top, top that yeah. 
or that's got to get fixed. That's that's what we're trying to fix. Yeah. And ideally, we would fix the whole benefit system so that the things didn't phase out at the same time and so that they kept going longer and so that the phase-out schedule for each one made sense. But um, a lot of these are federal. The Child Care One, although it is federal, we fund more than that amount, so we have much more flexibility in continuing to fund it and change the rules. So the idea was to do those two things that are mentioned in the bill. Um, one is to recognize that the cost of childcare would go up because childcare workers, many of them are paid less than what would be the $15 an hour minimum wage. And the second piece is we would try to make it so that people who had an increase in their income equal to the increase in the minimum wage would not lose, would not go on this down slope. So essentially what we'd be doing is we'd take that sliding fee scale where the subsidy phases out, and it has income brackets, just like our income tax. When we want to avoid bracket creep, we index the income brackets by the CPI. In this case, we index the subsidy brackets for the child care thing on the minimum wage, the change in the minimum wage. So the, where you're seeing that slope down, we're about 45000 and so forth, you could level that off. Right, you just yeah. move it, it'll still slope down, but you'll move it over. So that you're filling this in slice by slice. The next year it move over a little bit more, the next year it move over a little bit more. We wouldn't solve the problem completely, but we would solve it, so to speak. Slice by slice, we'd solve it. Um, and um, I remember a few years ago when we were uh, presented this in, uh, health and welfare we presented the issue, and um, Senator McCormick said, so what's the answer? And the answer was, it was so daunting to think that we could completely fill that in, that we couldn't come up with it. But anyway, this is a way to do it in slices. Um, so at the same time that the minimum wage is increasing and you know people are reaching these stages, we are also getting um, more money from income tax from these people because we have more income, and we're also getting savings from other programs. Like EITC. Like EITC, exactly. Um, so in, for 2020, this would be a half of a year because this would take place um, January 1st. So we're estimating that the cost would be about $800,000. Um, but we also estimate that we get $1.3 million in increased revenue and savings from other programs. Not to say that it would all be directed to this, but we would have that coming in. So it would, could cover the cost. Um, but for one year. Calculus is it's hard to uh, identify and recapture, so to speak. Right. Um, that's, the, that's the issue, is how we can target that money or you know how to make the appropriation linked to this um, and then when you get all the way to 2024 um, in 2024 dollars the cost would be um, 11 million 11.1 million over current law and but the increased revenue and savings would be 18.3 million over current law I haven't done all that calculations for the interim years, but last year when we did it, it was, the first year was the most difficult one, and then, we, you know, the revenue increased faster than the cost. Yeah, and last year we were when we were writing this, um, uh, we knew that our base in childcare uh, was a bit high. Remember, and we um, knew that, and therefore we wrote it in such a way that we knew that that money was there in the base. Um, and it was because the caseload was down and it gave us the capability within the appropriation to, um, to absorb that first year, as you're saying, before the offsetting revenues materialized. I don't think we're quite in the same place this year, but um, that's what we'll have to um, figure out relative to, last year was easier because of that, um, because of that base. And we knew the money was there because this year we still had that 2.5 million in the base, and about 
25% uh, of it would and, have. And we also got a substantial chunk of money from the feds. We did, but that was simply to increase a particular area. But yes, that's true. And we put it into um, infant and toddler yep. uh, rates. And we brought their rates up to, yeah. um, to um, 18 um, rates. Yeah. And that helped us to carry, you know, but so we, we had that money. But we still have rates. Um, for school age and preschool that are um, 2008 rates. Well, um, we have another proposal to address that. Um, but I'm just saying in terms of funding, um, that relationship between minimum wage and the child care. Last year was, um, we were in a different spot, so to speak. So, okay, thank you. Other questions of Deb? Well, really a question, but it, being a, an employer, I'd, I'd hate to have to pay my employee two dollars, three dollars more an hour and still not have them get up to the line and then have them actually lose uh, a buck or two from their services. Um, you know, if, if you're really going to help people, Let's help them and, and straighten out both sides of it. The employer should be paying more, but we shouldn't be cutting, cutting it off in there. We should be taking the extra money and filling that in, but not just for one notch at a time. It takes like 14, 15 years to, to get to the end. If you only did one line a year, I think there's 14 in there or something. Uh, and by the time you got to the end, you'd have another sag up above, maybe. Just a matter of whether sag occurs at the higher income? Well, the cost of living keeps going up, and the cost of child care and everything else. Um. So um, we do have to address the commitment is to address the most pressing impact, and that's on the child care um, uh, subsidy for lower income working families. Um, and last year, as I said, it was easy because we knew we had the uh, money within the child care appropriation to accommodate um, that, that protection. So, um, Damien, unless we have further questions of Deb, we have Damien that's here who is going to. Um, propose some language for us, I think, or or not. I, think I got a group waiting for me, and I'm going to have to get out and just tell them that I'm waiting. Go ahead. Oh. Okay. Well, it is three o'clock. I mean, we are um, we are at our break time, and the, and we have a whole hour for vets home. Yeah, if I meet with them now, you'd probably have to meet with them for about 15, 20 minutes. Um, well, then why don't we take the break? Uh, but I hate to have them. <coughs> What's your meeting with? So they're going to have an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half of time, huh? If they get an hour, half an hour with me, they'd get a half an hour with you. And okay. I'm just wondering if uh, how people want to do it. I know people have got uh, sometimes appointments that are booked during the break. Do you want to break, come back on this at 3.30? Which means we're going to be pushing the vets home later in the afternoon, Ooh, David. Uh, yeah. I'm getting picked up by the shuttle from oh. Toyota at, oh, at 425. Okay. I was going to show you five minutes. All right. Um, oh. Well, why don't we um, shorten the break time and come back uh, about 20 after? Okay. And okay. Um, Dick, if you're a little bit late, but we'll yeah. keep going. Start without me. Yeah. I'll probably vote for the bill. Well, I know what you're. It really would be nice to have some mechanism so that you don't nice have to, to revisit not this. Have to um, vote for the going yeah. Uh -huh. Every year. And if somehow the base isn't right, and you know what the adjusted uh, factor should be, um, but that's not what we have. Right. So, okay. So 20 minutes, if you could please be back. Question: We don't have the pro tem here on um, well, minimum your, wage. Keep your talk handy. In case we do, I mean, what is the big problem with putting the book on the floor? Because they don't want you to step on it. 
I'm not going to step on it over there. Um, if you want, I can put it here. On Both you and Diane Snelling had to always go over there to get the book. <laughs> I don't know why you can't leave it somewhere right around oh, there. Yeah, we well, could. That's play with your February. Um, I'm not getting peevish. I'm just saying it's been, it's been going on for years. Um, committee, um, we have two things left. One is to finish the discussion on the minimum wage and whether we want to vote on it today or not. The pro tem is not here, and he needs to be when we vote. Um, we do have Damian Lennon, Lennon's um, um, amendment that makes it clear that if someone's appointed who is getting paid as part of their job, they don't get the per diem, which is just a, more of a technical. Um, we have, um, in our area, if we agree to the language that the house, uh, that the the um, economic development has, it is um, making it clear that our intent is to um, uh, recognize the cliff impact on the child care mm -hmm. benefit, both on providers. Um, I know that um, they took a lot of testimony, and I think, you know, the concern, and I think we need to be very conscious, and I think this gets back to some extent what Bobby was talking about. But many, many services are funded by state government. And I'm talking about nurse, you know, as Senator Westman said, uh, BNA, but also our nursing homes. Um, and anybody that gets Medicaid. And uh, anyone who gets Medicaid or where they're providing a personal service. It could be youth services, for example. I don't know. But if we are basically saying that we want um, this wage um, to move up, then those of us who sit around this table have to recognize that those costs are going to come back and have to be recognized. And we have experienced it in some extent with, um, with the contract negotiations with our personal care providers where the budget found accommodation to address those salary increases. And I think that's one of the concerns is that we understand the collateral impacts are way beyond the child care program. And um, it is going to put pressure um, and an obligation. On the other hand, um, I know that we've had this circular discussion. Many people are concerned that low wages externalize costs onto government programs and, uh, the, uh, and that governments are providing benefits that are at a level greater than they need to be. Now, maybe when we get into the full return of this and the analysis that's done by joint fiscal and um, staff, um, the return back either in terms of avoided savings on benefit programs or additional revenue that might come in in the form of taxes. Um, Your car keys? I guess so. <laughs> You're Did you inherit <laughs> Nobody would want my car. And Kitty borrowed it. Oh. But she must have gotten back. And she she broke it, it, well, it's a stick shift, and she hasn't driven one for a long time. But I, well, I think old. she made it. Well, it is old. And it's dirty, too. She told me it was quite uh, in need of um, <laughs> um, care. Yes. I said, I don't care. All I do is want to key and turn it on and go down the road. So my only point is yeah. getting back to the wage is that we need to understand what those collateral impacts. On the other hand, we can say as a state of Vermont, do we have an obligation to pay people a, de a decent wage and the extent to which we have um, had people work in these programs. Make um, collapse in and nursing homes. What? Make collapse in nursing homes. Well, or we're going to have to, um, we've been providing extraordinary relief. Um, so, oh boy, we're getting killed on the House bill, H57. Is that appropriate for us to amend that bill? To amend what? The wage bill. To do what, Bobby? Hmm? To do what? Well, if we're going to vote it out of here, um, maybe we could fix it so it'd be a little bit more palatable. Well, the big 
problem is um, if you want to expand the protection here in advance, the more money you have to advance before the revenues and those um, service reductions kick in. That's so. Um, I think what we were talking about last year was um, a half year cost was eight hundred thousand. Was it eight hundred thousand total? Something Close like to that. So um, that's what we're deciding on right now. We're not appropriating it. it this is just language, and this creates um, um, an expenditure that we have to address when we build the budget. Uh, knowing what our fiscal situation is at this point to extend beyond this right now, I, I don't see how we can do it. I, I'm just saying we're going to have to recognize those costs out into future years because like nursing homes are going to have to meet those higher costs and that's going to have to be recognized in, in the rates that they're paid. Yeah, and we don't do a direct appropriation that way to them in the same way we do for child care. So um, I'm not going to um, sit without the pro tem here. I'm going to just hold off a vote on this. Um, further testimony. Um, we can pass out for people's consideration. Um, the, it's the technical change relative to the compensation um, for who's going to be on that study committee. And we will. Um, uh, defer a final action until tomorrow. Okay. And um, I know that we're running against the clock. Senator McCormick is going to leave um, 20 after you said. Yeah. And so we have um, uh, on the schedule, and you yeah, have I'm, to. I'm going to leave the corner after 40. Okay. So um, I'm going to, at this point, we will just um, move on from minimum wage. People have more questions or concerns. Um, I think we know that, um, th that this is a complicated um, issue and um, one that I don't want to uh, pass out right now simply um, to give people more time to consider and um, to have the pro tem here as well when we do the roll call on it.